Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We're continuing our series. So, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but we're in a very rapidly changing world. We've had a lot of natural disasters recently. You know that the temperature of the earth is supposedly rising. The U.S. is becoming very polarized. There are new ideas that come up all the time, every day, instantaneously, and they become viral. I actually wanted to congratulate you on being here today. Did you know that 9-23-2017 was predicted by many Christian uh, denominations or churches that yesterday was the day of the rapture, that Christ was supposed to come back yesterday because the alignment of the stars that happened yesterday happens once every 7,000 years. There's all kinds of false ideas that are happening inside the church and outside the church. There's no shortage of false teachings that are in our religion, but also against our religion. You can't go to school in modern America where our education is so extremely advanced and research is in abundance in every possible field without being introduced to ideas that men come up with that are opposed to our concept of God. You can't really get a degree in college today without facing them, especially in your science classes. You have to be able to encounter these ideas and you have to know how to deal with them. They can shake your faith. And for decades, the more knowledge we have of science, the more we supposedly have the greater ability to disprove this crazy notion that there is a God who transcends all things. For the last 150 years, around the time of Darwin, there's been a tremendous effort to come up with theories that would disapprove the existence of a single creator. Now, this is one of our favorite verses. We say it in the Psalms every morning. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. That's something that we as Christians, we look outside and we see God's traces everywhere. But it was pretty much for this verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That single verse is the foundation of the Bible. This verse we stand on. If this didn't happen, if this verse where God didn't create the heavens and the earth, then why would you read anything else after that? If the very beginning of the book is wrong, why continue? And so there are so many people that were motivated to try to destroy this verse. But this verse was the factor that numerous scientists tried to disprove. This verse says that there was a moment in time that this transcendent being brought everything into being from non-existence. And that is critical. That idea of bringing things into existence from non-existence. That is the definition of creating something. It's strange to scientists that without anything other than words, he made something from nothing. That everything, just by an act of voluntary creation, voluntary creation by a supernatural being, to create something out of nothing? I mean, that sounds crazy to scientists. What about the laws of physics? We hear that matter is neither created nor destroyed. How is it that there could all of a sudden be something that just created matter? Well, Genesis chapter 1 is actually quite a puzzle for many people. How many of you have chosen careers in science because you loved chemistry and physics? And you said, this is what I'm all about. Exactly. So for that reason, I will try to simplify some of the arguments that are made in science today. And that science has slowly, has slowly grown closer to discovering that they were wrong. The more science develops, the more we come to this statement. 
For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountain of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. What scientists are trying to do and trying to discover and find out after all their efforts, they finally think they figured it out only to realize that what they figured out, theologians have been saying from the beginning. It's actually on the very first page of our book. There are three questions that we're going to discuss today. And I just want you to realize this cannot be an exhaustive defense about all the scientific evidence that proves the presence and existence of God, that proves intelligent design. I get 40 minutes, but I do want to direct you to one name. This is Dr. Hugh Ross. I used his, his videos in preparing this. I've heard him give talks. He actually has an organization called Reasons to Believe. It's actually down the street from St. John Church. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him and his website, reasons.org, is an incredible website. Just briefly about him. He grew up in Canada in a society where he had never known any Christians. He didn't meet a single Christian. The only Christians he had met were when he was a teenager, and there were the Gideons that gave him a Bible. Outside of that, he didn't know what a Christian was. He was in a very atheistic society. Um, and... He was fascinated with science. So at the age of seven, he knew that he was going to be an astrophysicist like all seven-year-olds do. So he went to the library and he read everything. And he became this genius that at the age of 16, he was the director of the observatory laboratory in Canada. And he was like this. He was giving lectures to everyone in colleges. In high, as a high school student, he was giving lectures at universities. Incredible genius. Someone taught him about the idea of the Big Bang Theory. And he believed in it based on what he could see in the universe. And uh, he said, well, if there was a Big Bang, then there must have been a Big Banger, someone who began it. And so he began to study philosophy and all these um, theories about God. And he wasn't satisfied with any of them because they didn't agree with science. So then he decided to study the religious books of the world. He said where he lived, there were a bunch of Asian refugees. So he started to read the books of Buddhism and Hinduism and the Quran. And he went through them to see, was there anything that described a God that agreed with science? And he dismissed all of them. Till finally he decided to get that Bible that the Gideons had given him. He read the first page and he stopped. He says, this is the first thing I've ever read that describes science from a religious point of view accurately. He says, I couldn't understand everything in it, but it didn't disagree with what we had believed. He looked at the chapter one. He says there's about 12 or 13 events. And the fact that Moses over 3000 years put these events in order. The fact that he put the right events there, but that he put those events in order. The chance was about 1 times 10 to the 34 that you can get those 12 or 13 events in order. He's like, how could he have known this unless the person who designed it revealed it to him? He spent his whole life then learning about science and reconciling it with the Bible their organization has, he started churches, but their organization has four scientists. They write plenty of books. Their website is amazing. If you're looking for any scientific evidence or just look at his videos, Hugh Ross on, on YouTube, they're amazing. I tried to boil down some of it in our talk today, and I apologize. I'm going to go fast. Some of it will be a lot, and hopefully you'll get something out of it. There's three main questions that we have to answer. Did the universe have a beginning? That's actually was very controversial even up until a few decades ago. The second question, is it chance that the universe happens to support life on this planet? 
Like, is there a greater purpose for men being on this planet? Was the universe somehow created to support us? As if we were the center of the universe? Is it by chance that that happened? And then the third one, which is critical, is where did life actually come from? So, let's begin. Hopefully this will help direct you to the idea of intelligent design. So, Hugh Ross there took a course at Caltech. And there was Carl Sagan. I don't know if you ever heard of Carl Sagan. He was a famous scientist in the 70s, 80s. He taught at Caltech. Brilliant mind. And his idea was this. The cosmos always was, always is, and always will be. There's nothing else. Just the cosmos. Well, about 100 years ago, people started to look at the second law of thermodynamics, which everyone, what is it? It's like quoting a Bible verse, right? <laughs> okay, the second law of thermodynamics talks about entropy, how the universe is becoming more and more disorderly and how things begin to decay or lose their energy. And you guys know this, right? Um, food rots, cars rust. They also say that the sun is losing its fuel, that the sun is losing its heat. I know you're thinking you better get in those Caribbean vacations before that happens. We still have a few more years. But the idea that these things might be losing their energy means that they might have had a maximum source of energy. About us, so they were also saying that maybe the sun was ignited at some point in time. Then you may have heard of this name Hubble, Hubble Telescope. So this scientist in the 1900s, he was the first one to look through a hundred inch telescope at the universe. And he was astonished by what he saw. He saw that the galaxies, as many as there were, that they were getting further and further apart. Well, it didn't take long for them to realize that if they were getting further and further apart, that means at one time they must have been closer together. They extrapolated the theory of relativity by this guy named Albert Einstein, who did not believe in God and really wanted to oppose God. Unfortunately for him, his theory of relativity actually helped to show that the universe actually began at a single point. I want you to think about it, and it's called a singularity. So in science, it's called a singularity. They believe that all the universe, everything in the universe, all matter, all time, all space, and all energy started from a single, infinitesimally small point that exploded. Hence, the Big Bang Theory which happens to be the theory that as we discover more and more throughout the universe, it seems like that is kind of what happened. They can't point to anything before that point because there was no time before that point. That was the beginning of the universe. That may not seem like a big deal to you, but... There was nothing outside of time and space. Everything in the universe was inside time and space. So that there were no laws of physics before that time. The laws of physics began at that time. Everything we know began at one point in time. There is no natural explanation. All the scientists that believe in natural uh, life and natural origin of the universe, they could not explain how all of this happened from one tiny point, and all they could say is this is called a miracle. The greatest scientific miracle is the beginning of the universe about 15 billion years ago from a point. What's interesting is that this is described exactly in chapter 1 of Genesis by Moses, who was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now, I know the Egyptians are wicked smart. 
and they must have taught him a lot, but they're not the ones who revealed this to him. This was revealed to him by God. It's amazing as Hugh Ross was reading through the Bible, how I was just telling you how the universe was expanded and how it began at one point. He says in chapter one, it says it began at one point. He has at least nine references where it says, God stretched the heavens. He says, it's not like he just stretched, but that he continued to expand the heavens. He says, it was coinciding with what science is telling us that the universe had a beginning, that the universe is continuing to expand, and that the universe is getting colder. And apparently, he has references for that in the Bible. He says, about 15 billion years ago, in order for this to happen, this Big Bang happened. They said, in order for that to happen, there's all kinds of radiation that had to have happened, and they have to still be around. So then this guy won the Nobel Prize for discovering that those types of radiation are still in the universe, and they're still hitting the Earth. And he's this guy. This guy, Arno Penzias. He won the Nobel Prize for discovering cosmic background radiation associated with the Big Bang. This is what he says. The best data we have are exactly what I have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible. The guy who discovered all this radiation says, the exact conclusions that we have now, I could have come to with just the books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible. That's pretty amazing that that's what scientists are now coming to believe. So, there's a book by Dinesh D'Souza. I don't know if you ever heard of the name Dinesh D'Souza. He's a great apologist. He wrote this book about what's so great about Christianity. And these were his conclusions about the Creator based on the Big Bang and that concept. So let's go over it. The universe was produced by some sort of mind. Mind produced matter, not the other way around. Some people say that matter just existed and then all of a sudden we get intelligence. He says, no, intelligence brought into existence matter. He says this. The universe comprises all there is of nature, contains everything that is natural. That means the creator must be outside of nature. So since he didn't use natural forces to create the universe, the creator is supernatural. Space and time are within the universe, so therefore the creator is outside of time and space, which is to say the creator is eternal and as the universe is material material the creator is immaterial that means he is spirit and then the universe was created from nothing that means the creator is incomprehensibly powerful or as best we can tell omnipotent if you look at the conclusions of the big bang we can see that god is supernatural eternal intelligent, spiritual, and all-powerful. I think that's pretty amazing. Now, it's one thing to say, okay, the universe started. But it's interesting to think that maybe it was started in a way to support us. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking is one of the major scientists of the 20th century. You guys are like, yes, we've heard of every scientist you've mentioned so far, every one of them. Okay, so this is what he says. He wrote a book called The, the History of Time. And he says this, If the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller, so if the, the Big Bang started to slow down one second after it started, by one part in 100,000 million million, the universe would have recollapsed before it reached its present size. So once it started, if one second later it got slower by 100,000 million millionth, it would, have, it would have collapsed. I mean, that's precise. But had it gone any faster, it would have expanded so quickly that life wouldn't have existed. It's interesting, there are about 200 billion galaxies, give or take three or four. Every one of those galaxies has about 200 billion stars. It's kind of strange to think 
that this huge universe was created with a purpose for us. Like, if you look at the size of the universe, there are certain stars that are way out there that their light burns out, like they burn out before the light even hits the earth. Like, what is the purpose of all that? And we are like one tiny speck in the whole scheme of things. Well, there's evidence to suggest that the way the universe was created, it was done so that it could support life on this planet. Scientists have discovered 202 specific parameters that are necessary to sustain life on this planet. And I'm only going to go through 180 because 202 would take way too long. No. The gravitational pull has to be exactly the way it is. The Earth rotates on an axis slightly at an angle around the sun. If it's not at that angle, we can't support life. The Big Bang, the way it expanded, the time it did, the amount of oxygen on the Earth, the amount of carbon on the Earth, the thickness of the atmosphere, that Saturn and Uranus and the moon, those other planets are necessary to be where they are in order for us to support life. All these parameters, these 202 parameters, they looked at these, they said, what are the chances that these 202 parameters that happen to support us, because people that believe in naturalism, like there's no design, it's just by chance. What are the chances that all that happened and we just happened to be alive? It's actually 1 in 10 to the 229th power. That's 229 zeros. That all of this could have just happened so that it could support life on Earth. Or do you think maybe that everything that happened in the universe might have just been planned by someone? Hugh Ross was saying in his talk, he says, not only if the universe had expanded any quicker or slower, we wouldn't be here. He says, but the amount of mass in the universe has to be exactly the way it is. He said, if the mass of one dime was added to the universe, we would not be alive. Could you imagine the mass of one dime? That's how precise this universe is, and it allows us to live. So where did it come from? The universe began from a tiny point. And that tiny point had a beginning that was outside of time, outside of space, outside of matter, and it was God. And how the universe was created so that it could support life on only one planet. Now here's the question. And this one really bugged me when I was in college. You have to answer the question, where did life come from? Like if I were to just cut up our skin, cut up our organs, you would see that we are a bunch of cells. Cells are made up of proteins and DNA and stuff. And if you break those down, those are just molecules that are just like atoms that are electrons and protons. So couldn't it just happen that we're just a bunch of little protons and electrons and neutrons all together and here we are? This was what we were pushing our professors in, in college about, and they never explained it more than this. But they said in the 50s, there was an experiment to show that they could create life. It's like, what? It says, yes, in these controlled environment, they had water, they had all the right building blocks, and they zapped it with so much electricity that eventually some parts bounded, and they think they formed an amino acid, which is amazing. I mean, that's... That's nothing, actually. That's nothing in a very controlled environment. And actually, one amino acid is nothing. And it turned out not even to be a useful amino acid. But here's the idea. That if somehow the building blocks of humans began sometime in the universe, then maybe we could say that over billions and billions of years, we happened to just exist. Carl Sagan said that the Earth was a primordial soup, meaning that all the necessary elements for us to exist were in the Earth. By the way, that, that experiment was a total failure, and they've never been able to reproduce it, and they've shown that it was completely false, 
and there is no way for them to create life out of nothing. But the theories are all the building blocks have been here forever, and over billions of years, it's likely that eventually they're just gonna they're just gonna join and make something useful. So uh, I'm gonna talk about this primordial soup. So scientists have discovered about 3.85 billion years ago that there were tons of meteors throughout the universe, bombarding all the planets. One about the size of Mars hit the Earth. Apparently, uh, it really changed the atmosphere of the Earth. It thinned it to a very thin layer, which we have now. It actually made the... Uh, Temperature of the Earth about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The Earth was covered with lava 200 kilometers deep. That was 3.85 billion years ago. Um, and then it turns out they found life existed about 3.8 billion years ago. So the difference is about 50 million years. Well, it turns out for the Earth to cool down from the 4,000 degrees to a temperature that we could survive in is about 50 million years. Then all of a sudden, life shows up. Life just happens to show up at around 3.8 billion years ago. So this whole idea of billions of billions of years needed for these random molecules actually didn't happen. At that time of the, the temperature, none of these prebiotic molecules. None of the molecules that are used to build us could have existed at that time. They would have all been destroyed. Then in 50 million years, all of a sudden there's life. So the idea of the primordial soup, that all of our elements just happen to be here, they say, no, couldn't have. There is no primordial soup. There is no real amount of time for that to happen. I'm going to fast forward so I don't drive you crazy. You guys know how life happens, right? A cell has proteins and DNA. I'll just stick with proteins and DNA. I'll make it simple. DNA is the message on how to make everything in the next cell, right? It's just the code. It's like the manual on how to produce more. How do you get the code to actually be implemented? You need proteins. How do you make proteins? From the DNA. But how do you make the proteins? You got to have the DNA, but the proteins act on the DNA to make more proteins. So what came first, the DNA or the protein? They don't know how to explain where the first DNA is. But they said, there is nowhere on earth it could have happened at this one conference called The Origin of Life. They have these people, these gather every year, discuss the origin of life. And they've said, what we've determined in this conference, and he's an atheist, that nowhere on the planet Earth could life have just originated. That nowhere on Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, or the moon, that nowhere, other, there's nowhere where these building blocks just happen to exist. They're like, how did it get to Earth? Some people were saying, oh, it could have happened by some dust particles that went through the universe and there were bacteria that were on the dust and then it landed and that's how we got it. And they say, well, there's no way it could have survived the radiation or the UV light or the heat of the atmosphere and actually make it to the earth. They said, well, maybe there was a two meter rock with a bacteria exactly in the center of the rock that happened to land on the earth. And they said, one guy calculated the possibility is that is one, it would take 1 times 10 to the 16th years for one of those rocks to hit the earth. And he says, and the universe is only 1 times 10 to the 13th years. So it's an extra million years for that one rock to happen. So then the conference said the only way it could happen is aliens. Aliens. And some people believe that aliens brought life to earth. Fine. Who created the aliens? Where did their matter come from? Where, where did their 
DNA and the, how, how did they and then they said how did they build a spaceship to travel through the universe with all these different gravitational pulls and temperatures and heat and energies it said it's almost impossible to go from what we can't see them so from one end of the universe to here it would take forever and there's no sign of them and even then the life would not have survived they cannot find any way for life to exist on the earth without a miracle. It's amazing. As much people tell you about science being this way to disprove God, they're slowly beginning to realize that what the theologians knew when they first read the Bible, they're beginning to understand. If someone asks you, this God could not exist, tell them, do you know where the universe began? It came from a single point and began to expand. And the only way that point could expand is that something had to cause it to expand. That's outside of time, outside of space, that is outside of matter. Something that's eternal. That sounds like a transcendent being. How the universe sustained life on this earth as if mankind was the center of the universe, which our God tells us that we are has to be through irre like most ridiculous chance. There's no way we would still be here if, if the chances were 1 times 200 times 10 to 240. There's no way. Then the last thing is, where did life come from? It didn't just happen. Then let's just say one thing. Let's say one bacteria did land on Earth, and, it, and then they say, we came from the most basic source of life, bacteria. A scientist, uh, he was a Catholic priest. He was at my old university. He was a Catholic priest who became an evolutionary biologist. He stopped being Christian. He actually came up with this calculation. He says, what are the chances with super efficient evolution in the perfect situation that with all the variances, like let's say there was one bacteria, the chance that that one bacteria could actually eventually become a human. You want to know what his calculation was? This Catholic priest turned atheist. His calculation was the chances are 1 times 10 to the 1 million zeros. Then the scientist after him and said, but you didn't calculate for the changes in the earth in that time period. It's actually 1 times 24 million zeros. It's impossible. It's impossible. He says the likelihood is like you winning the California lottery consecutively three million times in a row, buying one ticket every single time. If you think your chances are that good, it's impossible that any of this could have happened without an intelligent design. So be confident that you have a God who can and has done everything. Go be blessed. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Our dear Master and Savior, Jesus Christ, you are such an amazing, beloved, intelligent, kind, thoughtful God. That of all the amazing things that you made, you called us the star of your creation. We're the only things that you blew your spirit into us. We're the only ones, the only things that you created to be after your image with such amazing beauty and love and potential. Help us to grow in our confidence that you are not far out there, but you are intimately involved in our daily lives. That you care about every little detail of how and why we are made and for what purpose and where we are going. I pray, dear Lord, that you would strengthen our faith, but not that we would have faith just in our relationship with you, but that you would increase our minds, our hearts, and our spirits, that we would be bold witnesses, that we would be lights as you were in all the universe, that not only do the heavens declare the glory of God, but why should your people not also declare your glory? I pray, dear Lord, that we would be shining lights, that we would truly declare your glory in all that we do, whether we eat, drink, or live, whatever we do, may it be all for you. I ask for your mercy, your forgiveness on us, dear Lord, and you allow us to continue to walk in a way that pleases 
and honors you. Bless this church, bless our Father, bless the bishops, the popes, and everyone who calls upon your name. Through the intercession of St. Mary, Archangel Michael and Gabriel, the witnesses of the transformation, and all your saints when we say, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through Christ Jesus our Lord. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. One last announcement. For those of you who are interested in the scientific explanations, actually, the diocese is actually having a day on October 14th at St. John Church. Many of you are familiar with it. The bishops are arranging it. They're inviting the high school, the college youth, and all those who are interested in knowing about the scientific evidence of us. October 14th. They're having a whole day seminar with four or five lectures. Go and attend if you're interested.